Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. I think we had a little bit of a compete with the platform keynote, so I mean, we might have some stragglers come in, but we'll go ahead and get started, and they missed out. Um, well, let's deck, take a step back. So today we're going to talk about the Apex Lifecycle Handler. So uh, <coughs> myself, Steve Pepper, uh, lead developer on the Canvas team, um, been working on Canvas for about two and a half years now, and we have some really exciting things that we came out with in, in the most recent release, and so we're here to go over them, specifically the lifecycle handler and how you can actually use Apex with your Canvas app to start to control some of the signed request parameters and functionality therein. Before we get started, if you guys haven't seen this, this must be your first session of Dreamforce ever, but uh, I do have to show you the safe harbor statement. Uh, Safe Harbor essentially says that if you are making any purchasing decisions, please make those decisions based on what is generally available at the time of purchase. Uh, do not make decisions based on forward-looking uh, functionality. What we're talking about today, the lifecycle handler, is currently GA, so feel free to base your purchasing decisions on this. If you do have any questions on what is GA and what is not, feel free to let me know at the end. Like I said, my name is Jay Hurst. I'm a senior product manager with our platform team, specifically on Force.com Canvas. And Steve Pepper is one of our lead developers for the, for the team. So layering how your Canvas app uh, behaves can be a little complex. If you've used Canvas before, you, you may have experienced some of this. But let's kind of get a show of hands. How many of you have used Canvas before in your orgs? OK, a few of you. Um, of that, how many have actually wished that you could control the sign request a little bit better? One, two, three, there we go, okay. So let's take a little step back. How many know what Canvas is? Okay, so I don't have to start all the way at the beginning, that's good. Uh, this, is a, this was set as an intermediate slash advanced course, so I'm going to not go too deep or too high level into the general functionality of Canvas. If you have any questions, see me after. We def I can definitely give you uh, links to our documentation and also uh, show you the, the video or point you to the videos of our intro sessions. But customizing the Canvas sign request. So the sign request is our default mechanism for delivering information to your Canvas application. So again, your Canvas application is exposed to the Salesforce, and you need to tell that application about the Salesforce context what page you're on, um, you know, where you're, uh, who the running user is, what org it's running in, things like that. So here's kind of the, the bulk list of the objects that we send to you. So when you receive the sign request as a post, you'll go ahead and break that down and in a JSON payload, you'll see things like the client information, user information, organization information, et cetera. Really the point of the sign request is so that when you hear from Salesforce, your app knows exactly what to display to the end user. Knows who that user is, what page you're on, what record they're looking at, things like that. So you can choose to meaningful information to the user without having to call back into Salesforce and gather it. So a lot of times these applications are built as mobile applications or since they are a third party app, you want to reduce any round trip time that you can. So if we, the more we can deliver to you up front, the better. Before the summer 14 release, which is when the Apex Lifecycle Handler came out, uh, you could only really control a few things. Um, through a visual force page, you could actually uh, assign parameters. So you could build your own free format JSON and go ahead and attach that into the signed request to be sent. So you could send any piece of information you wanted if you were using visual force. Or if you were using a chat or feed item, you, then you could go ahead and, and do the same thing, kind of uh, build an arbitrary JSON and, and send that along. But with the Summer 14 release, it became a little easier. What we decided to do was actually allow you to tie an Apex class to your Canvas application itself, and then at runtime, go ahead and manipulate the sign request before we send it to you. So you can set the class to say, look at some special parameters or go ahead and render uh, some special information, maybe run Apex queries, things like that, inject that into the Canvas app and then send it. And because you can tie it directly to the Canvas app definition, it's not limited to Visual Force or the Chatter Feed. Anywhere you can have Canvas, you can use the Apex lifecycle handler. So what does this look like? Um, this is a setup screen of the Canvas application. Hopefully you guys have seen it before, but there's a new field that says lifecycle class. Uh, you go ahead and click on there, and it will allow you to look up any Apex class that has the, the correct implementation. 
There's a few things that you can control. We'll go through those throughout the, the day, but the first is that you can remove certain sign request elements. So I did hear from some customers that they don't need some of the things like the links we provide you or information about the user. They're looking for more specific information. They're saying, why give it to me? I don't want it. It makes the payload too big. So we allow you to remove it if you want. You can uh, customize the parameters that's that freeform JSON or uh, customize record fields. Record fields is a new addition we came out with as well, where if you are actually on a Salesforce record, we are able to gather more information about that record on that first render. So if you're on an account, you can pull things like the account billing address or the name or things like that rather than just the ID. Previously, we'd give you the ID and make you call back in for this. Now we can give it to you in the, the first shot. You can customize the Canvas URL with the Apex Lifecycle Handler. <coughs> now it's key to note that you can only customize the path. We're not gonna allow you to change domain because we are kind of bordering into security land there. So if a admin has installed an app from you know, www.good.com, that's where they expect the calls to come from. They don't want you switching it necessarily to evil.com and doing something bad. So we'll let you change the path, but not the, not the full domain. And finally, we, I've been, if you've heard any of my other talks, I've talked about the error handling and allowing you to control it. We're actually allowing you to tie into it now. So if you wanted to generate a Canvas error prior to sending that signed request, maybe you want to check for the version of the Canvas app that's installed before you send it out. Now you can do that. So looking at removing the signed request elements. So it's pretty easy. Like I said, you can remove parts, to, parts of that signed request. Um, there's only really three areas that we'll allow you to remove right now. And those are the organization object, record detail object, and user information object. All of the other objects are actually needed by the framework in order to communicate, so we're not, we don't allow you to remove them, although you know, in the future that, that's something that might be possible. Essentially what you do, and it's, a, it's a little backwards, we apologize, but you essentially build a list of objects you would, or elements you would like to exclude. So in the case of what we're seeing here on the screen, you'll see I'm adding the context type organization, context type user. Those are, I'm adding to the group that I want to exclude. So when I run this sign request, I'm not going to see organization, I'm not going to see user in that payload. And when I say it's not going to be included, we, everything else will work just as you expect. We just literally don't include that object. We suppress it. Now, customizing parameters. So, the idea here is, like I said, we give you the ability through visual force and chatter to add your own parameters. But really what you want to do is you're probably going to want to render a lot of these at runtime. So if I'm on an account page, for instance, do something. If I embed my Canvas app on a contact page, I, I need to do something else. I need to provide different information so that my Canvas app can behave as it should. So what we allow you to do now, you tie it into the, the Canvas app or the Apex class. And essentially what you do, we see at the bottom here, the parameters, we just simply build up a new JSON object call, and here I'm adding new custom param and new value. I think I can actually point on this, there we go. So right there, so I'm adding a new JSON object and value, or key and value into that JSON payload. And then with the record information, you have the ability to add to basically run a pre-query, if you will, and, and include information in the sign request. So on the render, what I'm saying is add the name, billing address, and year started into, my, uh, in, into the payload. Now, we're kind of smart on how we, we're handling this, where since there, your Canvas app could be included on multiple pages, we don't want to error out if some of those fields don't exist. So you can put anything you want in this, in this list of fields, and we'll only return the ones that actually exist for that record. So for instance, we see here I'm including name, billing address, year started, but if we actually look at the payload, I see a name and a billing address, but no year started. That's because year started isn't a valid field in my account. So we just ignore it, we, pa we don't pass it through. We also do support star, so if you choose to say select star, we'll give you everything that that user, running user, can see. And this is where it becomes really easy, so you can build one application all of your selected fields, and then you don't have to build a different one because a user's visibility doesn't have access to that field. We just ignore it if needed. <coughs> Excuse me. Customizing the, the URL. So like I said, you can change that URL. You can change the path, but not the domain. 
And you can also add any query parameters you like. So this, is, this was one of the big asks. Is we, we have a lot of customers who are using very standard uh, browsing techniques, and they want to be able to add and remove query parameters as needed. So now you can do so. You simply just uh, set your new, your new value, or I'm sorry, your new path, and we inject it right there. So you'll see that we're going to alternate path, and we're passing in some unique key and some unique value. And that comes over as the Canvas URL as part of it part of the call. Not only does it come over as part of the call, but that's the actual URL that we will post the sign request to. And finally, the custom error handling. So uh, with standard Salesforce errors, you've probably seen if you get a, can't, a record not found or a record deleted, it kind of ejects you into a big white screen that says cannot find it. Um, the, well, leaving aside the UI implications there, we, we wanted to make sure we weren't ejecting you from your Canvas app out uh, if you were embedded on an account page, for instance. So instead, what we do is we actually format the error box to fit into the Canvas space, and it kind of will, it, you can actually get an error or an information message inside of the Canvas embedded uh, on your page layout. So with this, what we're doing is we're allowing you to actually plug into that. So you can actually render your own error. Like I said, in, in this case, I'm just doing a check on the running user, and if their first name is not Amy, then we'll say, or if it is Amy, we'll say, sorry, you're, you're not allowed to use this app. So you can do anything else, and like, like I said, you could actually plug into versioning, so you could say, I build one Canvas app, I upgrade it uh, maybe two months down the line, and I wanna say if a customer is running it and they're running version one, I don't want them to actually render because I no longer support version one. I wanna send them a message that says, hey, you're gonna need to upgrade. You could build that into the Apex class, and you never actually rend, try and render out of there. So there's a lot of neat error handling that you can do at this point. So with that, we wanted to spend a bulk of today actually doing demos, getting actual code for you guys to see. I'm going to bring Steve up so he can show you. We have a really neat app that he built that actually makes the signed request understandable in kind of a, I don't know, a folder drop-down format. So Steve? Thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, excellent. Thanks. Uh, again, my name is Steve Pepper. Uh, we're going to do a quick deep dive uh, into some Apex code. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're going to see a fully customized uh, Canvas request based on uh, the code that's been running in that Apex code. But before we get started on that, uh, I want to go ahead and show you what my app does. Um, so this is an app running, a Java app running inside of Heroku, uh, and it's got two views in it. One is a tree view, and one is a JSON. It's a typical representation of a JSON object. Now, obviously, the Canvas request here is empty because it's not being rendered inside of Salesforce. But once we render this app inside of Salesforce, uh, you're going to see a fully loaded tree structure that we can browse as we, as we go through this. Um, so the first thing we'll do, we'll go ahead and take a look at the app. Uh, and, and this particular Canvas app is dropped right on the account detail page. Uh, so it's, it's a great way to show what the tree looks like. Let me scroll down a little bit here. Okay, you can see the tree here. Uh, you can see a lot of good, good data that's, uh, that your app can use. Uh, and we're going to show you how to turn some of that off and turn some of it on, how to customize the content of that. <clears throat> so for example, if you go to the user object, uh, you can see a lot of user goodness. You see the user ID, first name, last name. Uh, if you're familiar with Canvas, you, you're probably already familiar with what this looks like. But uh, you can control whether that's shown or not. Uh, you can also can control whether the organization, what that looks like. That has organization ID, name, everything that you want to know about the user's company. In addition to that, you can see application, if I could type, sorry. Uh, you can see the application. You have metadata about the current Canvas application. You have the namespace name. A uh, special note to make here is that the Canvas URL, uh, we're going to show you how that's going to be different the next time we render this app. Um, also note that we have a new option this release called personal enabled. Um, and we're not going to go into too much detail about that, but because we have a session at 8 o'clock, 8.30 tomorrow morning uh, that kind of goes over what personal apps are all about. But it's also delivered to you uh, once you find out what it is. <laughs> I don't want to spoil that. But, um, so that's a kind of a nice piece or nice thing to have. Uh, the last thing uh, is a relatively new feature, which is the record object. Um, so we, before we realized that um, 
a lot of customers were using visual, visual force to pass IDs through parameters uh, into Canvas, and that was how they were showing which record to de detail to show. Well, we've recently released uh, automatic rendering of the current record information, which uh, shows some default information like the ID and the type of the object that the, the canvas is being rendered on. So uh, now that you've seen the app in action, uh, we'll go ahead and check out what the metadata looks like. So if we go into the connected app, you'll see the metadata about the canvas app, everything you've known and loved up until this point, but uh, you see the canvas URL. The one thing to note here is that we're directing the user to the slash canvas uh, resource with some, uh, some, some custom, you guys see that okay? With some custom query parameters on it. Now this app doesn't really use that query parameter at all, um, but it's for demonstration purposes, just how we're going to uh, leverage it and manipulate it inside of our Apex listener. Um, and here's the personal app option that we talked about. Now, when you have, we already have a com configured Apex class, uh, so we're going to go ahead and assign that class to this, con this Canvas application. We do that by going to the magnifying glass here, and we have two classes here, but we'll only pick the first one because it implements the interface we were talking about. Um, the nice thing about this is we already support spidering, so if you select this, a Canvas application, or I'm sorry, if you select an Apex class that's bound to a Canvas app, we're automatically going to bring that into your package um, once you select that Canvas app as part of your package, and it'll all be bundled up at, um, and part of the installation process uh, for admin installed apps. So uh, we'll go ahead and save that. Okay, now that uh, we've tied that Apex class to the Canvas application, let's take a quick look at what the uh, Apex class is doing. Okay, basically the first thing you need to do here is that you need to implement the Canvas Lifecycle Handler interface. Uh, now, as Jay mentioned before, there are two methods with that, the, the exclude context types, as he mentioned, and the on render method. Uh, here we're, uh, just like Jay was mentioning, we are excluding the organization and the user object. Now, we don't want to exclude the record detail because that's part of the demonstration, so we're going to go ahead and leave that alone. Uh, but we're basically turning off these features inside the Canvas context. Okay, on to the onRender method. Um, so the onRender method is basically called the, when the sign request is retrieved or the context is retrieved from the client. Uh, if you're familiar with it, we do a REST endpoint, make a call to get the sign request, and then that's posted to our, your Canvas application. Now, we inject your Apex listener into that lifecycle, and it invokes the onRender, and that allows you to put your hooks in to customize what you need to do. So as Jay mentioned before, we, have, we support adding fields for the custom object. So you can, in here, we've added four fields, uh, the name, billing address, and industry, and salutation. One thing that's interesting about this is that three out of the four fields here are supported by the account object. So for example, name, billing address, industry, but salutation isn't part of that account object. Salutation is part of the contact object. The nice thing what Canvas does is it rec recognizes the fact that that's an invalid field and it won't show it, and it won't deliver that as part of the context. It basically won't, it just will not be part of the body. So here we're going to go ahead, that way you can kind of generalize your code uh, so that you may, if you want to support two different S object types. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is how you, again, manipulate parameters. Um, you'll notice one thing here is that you're ret retrieving the parameters as a JSON object and then parsing it into a map. Um, now you're probably wondering why are they doing this as JSON? Why can't I just do like a set and a get, like as a string and, a, and an int or something like that? Well, the nice thing about JSON is you can do a complex object and so you can deeply nest objects within objects and then save that as a JSON payload. So that, and that structure will remain intact as it comes into, uh, into your Canvas app. It's kind of a nice way. So if you want to do like related content on like an account or something like that, that, that's a great way to solve that problem. Again, you can customize the Canvas URL. Um, the important thing to note here is that I'm retaining the Canvas URL metadata, so we basically can take the picture of that, take maybe some query string parameters, adding some additional ones. So just like parameters, um, we're grabbing it into JSON, 
manipulating it and putting it back in. The important thing is we're retaining what may have been configured, say, in a Visual Force page or, say, in the feed, because you can set parameters in those particular locations. It's a, you, it's a good practice to take it in and then put your new, your new items in there and then go ahead and stuff it right back in, just like we're doing in the Canvas or URL here. So you can see we're basically redirecting the user to a new path uh, new canvas with some additional query string parameters that kind of simulates a multi-select box if you wanted to set some default values in your app or something like that. Okay, lastly, um, this is how you would do some exception work if you wanted to show a friendly user error. Uh, in this case, we're validating that the canvas app is showing inside the page layout. Uh, we'll go, ahead, or if it's not showing in, the page, in a page layout location, we'll go ahead and throw a nice little friendly error message to the user and, and render a nice little error box. Okay, so that, uh, that kind of summarizes um, what, the, uh, what the Apex code looks like. So let's go ahead and render it. Okay, so now this is the representation of the sign request after the, the Apex call, or code has been invoked. So if we search for user again, you can see that it's null. And you can also see that the organization is null. Uh, as well. So, and then if we uh, do a search for application, you can see we have a new Canvas URL shown here, pointing to the new Canvas uh, with some additional query parameters. Those are also represented in the request parameters. You can see that the selected items, val1, val2, and val8, those are all coming in through the Canvas URL. OK, let's take a quick look at the, the uh, record object. And you see some new attributes there, the name, billing address, and industry. There's no salutation there. But if we were to go over to the Contact tab and view the same app inside a contact. You'd see the ID, the name, which also applies to contacts, and the salutation. So one of the other nice things about the entity fields uh, is that we support the ability to wildcard. So let's say, for example, um, your application didn't know what kind of S object it is. And we, but we just want to show all fields relative to the record that we're currently showing. Well, we support that as well. So if we go ahead and go into our Apex class, you can see I have this line here commented out. Can everybody see that OK? You have this line here. I basically add the star attribute. Um, if I uncomment that, basically that's our wild card. We're just going to say, let's show all the attributes associated with the object uh, that the user can see. So it does support permissions. So if you uh, disallow some permissions to some users, those fields won't come al along into the payload. So we'll do a quick save there. And then go into our account. Now you can see all the, let me scroll down a little bit. Sorry about that. You can see all this data coming in from the account. These are all the fields associated to the account. So does that make sense? OK. We have a fully working app. We have our customizations that we already have. Uh, let's package this and ship it. Can we do that? Are we ready? Hold on. We haven't tested this app yet, right? So we need to test this to be able to package it and get the code coverage that we need. So we also have some test functionality built in so the, to make that easy for you as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a class looks like. Sorry. So we also have a test class. Uh, if you remember that our Apex listener um, does like five feature areas, does five things on the Canvas request. So we added five tests to this test class. Uh, we test the exclude types. We test entity fields, uh, let me zoom in a little bit so you guys can see that. Um, we have Canvas URL, exception handling, et cetera, like that. So now that we have test code, we can package that test up, and let's run it, and go ahead, and we'll add that test as part of the suite. 
So we're running the test. Once these pass successfully, we have five out of five tests. Let's pack, put it up on uh, App Exchange, and we're ready to rock and roll. So that's basically the power of the Apex handler. And um, I'm going to pass it back to Jay. So actually, if we can actually see the error handler. Oh, sure. Ah, my bad. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me, Jay. Um, if you remember, we basically don't allow the Canvas app to be rendered inside of anything but the page, page layouts. So if you can see, we, we do support the chatter location, but then it throws an error. So that really kind of doesn't make sense. But it's, it demonstrates how you'd, uh, how you'd throw an exception up to, to the user. So, so in this case, what you could do is if, let's say, you deliver your app to a customer, they install it. You, at that point, you don't have any control on where they put it. If they want to put it on the chatter tab, they can. If they want to put it on the account tab, they can. With this, you actually have the ability to continue to further optimize where it's going to show, what it's going to show to the end user. And the fact is, if it wasn't built for the chatter tab, you wouldn't want to show it because it wouldn't work right. So you want to, this gives you the added ability to start to control the behavior at, at more of the user level and at the, at the org level rather than at the app level. So that's it. Great. All right. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. All right, let's switch back. We're round in third here. Okay, so really what have we learned? I mean, the, again, the idea was to, to show you the lifecycle handler. For those of you that are, are familiar with Canvas, who've used Canvas before, hopefully this, this starts to unlock some of those challenges that you were seeing in the past year, giving you the ability to really start to control what you can do with Salesforce. We also saw, saw a good demo. It's, it's kind of a simple demo when you, when you think about it, but what it does is it, uh, we've shown it to a couple of customers and it really starts to unlock what the signed request is because that sometimes can be a little confusing as to what you're getting. Really what you're getting is a bunch of data from Salesforce and the idea is you take that data and you render content based on that data. So, if I'm on the account, I render this. If I'm on the contact, I render that. If I get this parameter, I render something else. So it's really all about giving your Canvas app the information it needs in order to render the correct screen to the end user. So with that, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, feel free, we have the mics in the center of the room. They should be turned on, or if we can get them turned on, that'd be great. But feel free to step up and ask away. So uh, all those controls were from Apex, which is really nice. Um, do you know of any changes to, uh, we, we use this, the service console mm -hmm. for our app now, and now the agents you know, want to use the care console. And sure. suddenly we have multiple tabs where previously the app understood to be only in one instance at a time. Now suddenly there's multiple tabs, and it's scary for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Is there a way from Apex to detect if you're in the care console? Right now there's a JavaScript library that tells that. But. Absolutely, so uh, it, basically you have access to the location parameter, which is inside of the signed request. So that, that was how Steve was showing we can, if we're on the chatter tab, we say, oh, it's not on the page layout, so we don't render it. The connect, uh, open CTI and the sales console are both specific locations where you can embed. So if you've embedded there, we can, we'll definitely show you that information. The, oh, okay. the other option would be if you are embedding a visual force page in that console, you can actually read what visual force page you're on. So we'll tell you you're on sales console one visual force page, and then you can choose to do something based on that. Right, okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, yeah, so when I try to enable the lightning components, I get the warning pop-up saying that Canvas apps won't be working. Sure. So is that a temporary thing, or uh, yes, how do you get around? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for those of to kind of repeat the question, uh, if, you, if you try and create a brand new Lightning component, you'll get a notification that says Canvas isn't supported with Lightning currently. Um, we, we are working for a solution for that. When Lightning components go GA, we'll definitely have a Canvas component in there as well, um, or at least support Canvas in Lightning. There's a little, there's some issues with domain security there, so we not quite finished. That's why, that's why we're in pilot. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I actually have uh, two questions. Sure. Um, first question, can you talk a little bit about the naming convention that you chose in lifecycle? Because it seems like um, all of the Apex code only executes when the initial render occurs. Maybe I'm mistaken? 
Sure. Well, it, it was kind of a, the, the idea was you want to inject into the canvas lifecycle as opposed to doing something post generation. Mm -hmm. So it was just, yeah, maybe it's not the most correct name syntactically, but okay, the idea is you can inject in. Now, as we go forward and we extend it, and Steve and I have already talked about it, there's certain things that you can't get in the, the handler because you haven't rendered the signed request yet, mm -hmm. right? So you can't get certain parameters from the signed request inside to make decisions based on. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at other ways that you could potentially inject at different times. So on the on render, maybe there's a post render time too before, and then there might be a post execute. So those are things that we're looking into, and as we go forward, we'll see expand. Okay, that might answer my second question. My second question was around, if you make a change within your Canvas app, what's the best practice for having information flow back into Salesforce, and particularly a Salesforce Apex handler that would act on that information? Sure, so if you're doing that, the best way is honestly probably gonna be embedding your Canvas app on a Visual Force page, because a Visual Force page can have its own controller. Now we did introduce eventing between Visual Force page and the Canvas app, so your Canvas app can actually throw a message up to the Visual Force page. The Visual Force page can listen for that and then execute an Apex method based on that. So I could say something, when the button is clicked and the record is saved, send a save message to Salesforce, at which time maybe do some pre-checks to see if we can save the record on the Salesforce side, something like that. So that's definitely possible today. It will, yeah. So it'll just layer on as well. So if you add parameters into the Visual Force one and you have parameters in the Apex Lifecycle class, you'll kind of just get a combination of those. Yep. Great. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. Appreciate you spending your afternoon with us. Hopefully uh, you found it enjoyable or at least enlightening. Um, kind of looking at the where to next, uh, we do have a number of sessions tomorrow. I don't know how I got backloaded with four sessions the last day of the conference, but <laughs> the agenda builder obviously hates me. Um, we do have a, a replay of the integration with the Windows desktop app. I believe that is the, re the replay, maybe I could be mistaken. But uh, we have a great demo tomorrow at 11.30 from a partner, uh, Salesways, about putting Canvas on the S1 platform. Um, and if you would like to learn about personal apps that Steve alluded to, it's tomorrow bright and early at 8.30. <laughs> so please join me. <laughs> um, we also have an integration workbook in the dev zone. If you haven't picked it up, please do so. It's a great resource. And if you have any questions, feel free to check out our topic page, or you can always email or tweet me. And finally, we are recording all of the Dreamforce sessions, both this one and every other session that you were not able to attend. Those will be uploaded, I believe, two weeks after Dreamforce. I could be mistaken, safe harbor, but um, they will all be up online. So anything you missed, feel free to check it out there. We, what we're planning on doing with the example is actually putting it out as a GitHub repo and doing a little blog post about it. So that'll be, check out the Canvas blogs. It'll probably be about a, two or three weeks after. But we'll definitely get it out there for you guys. Great. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate it.